oceans open wide, the fire falls down, heaven and earth collide, King Jesus, forever by my side, yeah. enjoyed the series it's the third message it's been an awesome series I've had a few people tell me pastor we're in revival I was like man I'm telling you it is happening God is doing some stuff and this message is has been a blessing and uh, by the way this is the third message as of now I have three more so this is going to be about six week series next weekend we're going to t- cover the, the label of failure we're going to talk all about failure the following week, we're going to cover the label offense. Okay, so it is powerful. I've been working on those, so it's going to be really, really good. I believe we're making progress in this series. Our vision here at One Community is to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. That's our vision. Our mission is to make disciples. That is our mission. And I believe the Word of God is a roadmap for identity. And I want to talk about today the children of Israel making their way out of slavery and into the promised land. Their journey should have taken 40 days at the most, but it took 40 years. Why? They were stuck. They were stuck. And when it comes to identity, we start off by saying, I am, and then we fill in the blank. So for me, I would say, I am Jason. I am a husband. I am a father. I am a new grandfather. Woohoo! Uh, we could say, I am old. I am young. I am growing. I am outgoing. I am an introvert. And so we use all of these I am's to describe who we are who our identity is. But I think one that we miss, that we don't like to admit, is this one, and that is, I am stuck. I'm stuck. Slavery is being stuck. It's moving in circles over and over and over again. I was preaching this one time years ago, and I started singing, she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. It just come out of me. And that's what that's like. Slavery is just you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And of course, we know that's the definition of insanity when you're just going in circles. And there are so many people that are just stuck. Now, I know talking to you guys in this room and by internet today that most of us have never been in slavery. Slavery is real. It happens all over the world. It still exists today. But most of us Americans have never even experienced slavery We don't even know what that's like. However, we are stuck in the area of our identity. And so in a way, I believe we are kind of slaves because we don't know who we are. I was thinking about this. I deal a lot with people who've had surgery, um, praying and so forth. And um, we've had some folks recently in our church that have had surgery And I hear this a lot. In fact, I was talking to Brother B this morning, Brother Barry back here, and he's been in rehab this week. And he said, man, they like to kill me in there. Man, he said, I couldn't hardly move when they got done with me in rehab. And when you have surgery, the doctor comes in immediately. And I mean, almost within a few hours after you wake up and you realize who you are and where you are, and he says, we got to get you moving. And you're like, what do you mean get me moving? I'm not going to move. Why do I want to move something that hurts? And the doctor will say something like this, because if you don't 
you're going to struggle with pain the rest of your life. In other words, what he's saying is, is we can have some temporary pain now and we can push through the pain now or we can have long-term pain later. Okay? So the doctor will get you up and he's going to get you moving. He's going to start stretching you. Trauma, when you have trauma, it makes you shrink towards the pain. It makes you give in to the pain. You have to pull against it. The scar tissue, you can't see it on the outside, but it's what's on the inside. It's what's underneath. And that happens to us. There are things underneath the surface. There's trauma. There's mental pain. There's abuse. There's depression. There's all these things that happen to us through the course of a lifetime that is underneath that scar tissue that's trauma. And we can't see it, but it's underneath the surface. And we do this with identity. It is easier to shrink towards the pain than to pull against it. Most of the time, it's a fear of trauma, a trauma that labeled us, that isolated us. And people have a lot of identity scar tissue. All we see is the choices they made and not what's underneath that led to those choices. And most of the time, the choices don't reflect the reason that led them to those choices or that place of pain and suffering. And so we look at that person and we start judging that person and we go, how could they do that? Why are they doing that? But what we don't realize is underneath, underneath the surface, there is something there that calls them to make that choice there's scar tissue there that's never been stretched it hurt too bad I don't want to talk about that I don't want to go there because it hurts amen it hurts if you want to be like Christ we have to see past the outward and we have to look at the inward wounds we have to look at the scar tissue that's there and the Israelites had a lot of trauma they had a lot of inward wounds and scar tissue from the Egyptians in fact they had 430 years worth of trauma and scar tissue 430 years of slavery so are you in Exodus chapter 3 let's look at two verses here let's look at verses 9 and 10 Now therefore, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. This is God speaking to Moses. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. In other words, I'm going to bring them out of slavery. Let's go back to verse 9. I want you to notice some things and highlight that or highlight this. Behold, I hear the cry of my people. I hear the cry of my children. I see the oppression. I see them being oppressed. And God said, I'm tired of it, and I want to bring them out. So in one day, after 430 years, God brings them out from their oppressor. Now we fast forward. They are on the edge of the promised land. Forty years have passed. They send in 12 spies to look, out, to look at the land, to scout out the land. Ten come back and said, we can't do it. Two come back and said, we can take the land. And we know that's Joshua and Caleb. So ten had scar tissue, lingering trauma from Egypt. And their attitude was, we can't. It hurts too bad. That will hurt too bad. We are small. They are large and we can't do it. Jacob, or excuse me, Joshua and Caleb came back and their focus was not on their inability, but their focus was on God's ability. The story shows that people can be saved and still not be free. Were they saved from Egypt? But they weren't free. Yeah, you see that? That people can know God and still have lingering trauma. They can be free physically, but not spiritually or mentally. Why? Scar tissue that's never been stretched. It's never been stretched. No, we're not going there. We're not talking about that. We're not doing that. I'm going to stay away from that. I'm going to run from that because it hurts too bad. Y'all know what I'm talking about? 
Did you know you can be a disciple of Jesus and still need deliverance? Their genetics was Father Abraham, a man who kings bowed down to, a man with tremendous wealth. But yet all they saw when they looked at God, they were looking through a filter of pain of their past, the scars of slavery. When God looked at them, He didn't see that. He saw them through the promise that He had made with Father Abraham, but they saw God through the pain of their past. Can I tell you today, it's all about perspective. It's all about perspective and identity. Write this down. We filter through our limited perspective. We filter through our limited perspective. Limited perspective will make it all about you, bound by the scar tissue of one word that we're going to talk about today and we're going to address, and we're fixing to kick it out of here in Jesus' name, and the word is called fear. Fear. At the root of all of this is one word. Fear. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. God didn't say in the beginning, guys, this can take 40 days or it can take 40 years. Well, we all know that's a no-brainer. They would have said, I want it to take 40 days. But God didn't do that. What did God do? Well, how do we know what God did? We, we look at the Bible and we read, and, and this is parallel to us today. By the way, the children of Israel represent the church. That, that's us. Egypt represents sin and the world. Trauma, pain, suffering, all of those things. That's what Egypt represents. Am I right? Here's what God did. He delivered them out of Egypt, and then he showed them their future, the promised land, and then that was the test of whether or not they were ready. He said, I'm going to sit back, and I'm going to watch your response, and your response will tell me whether or not you're ready. I want to say to you today, God still does that today. He still does it. How do I know? Well, I'm a pastor, and he uses me. And he does that with me sometimes, and he does that through me sometimes. And he'll say, I want you to do this with this person, and then we're going to sit back and watch what they do. I want to see their response. I want you, as their pastor, to do X, Y, Z, and then we're both going to sit back and see their response to what you just said. It's getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. Somebody just looked at their wife and said, I didn't know there's Presbyterian. <laughs> How many of you know God will look at our response? Why does he look at our response? To see if we're ready. He does that all the time. Where are you at on this journey? I just want to see where you're at. I want to see if you're ready. What this symbolizes is coming out of Egypt. Coming out of Egypt is what we call salvation. I get saved. I give my heart to the Lord. What's Romans say? Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and you'll be saved, right? That's how we're saved. Coming out of Egypt represents salvation. Deliverance is a two-step process, okay? Just so you know, it's a two-step process. The first process is salvation. At salvation, when they come out of Egypt, how many of you know they were free? They were free, but there's a second stage. There's a second part. It's Egypt has to be removed from us. They were out of Egypt, but Egypt wasn't out of them. Do you see that? You're not in Egypt, but Egypt is still in you because you take the scar tissue of Egypt with you into your future. Now, I want to say this. God can do a lot of things, but he will not change our perspective. That's up to us. God will do a lot of things. He can do anything, but he cannot change our perspective. God will not infringe on our free will. It is our choice to believe what we choose to believe. Even what we believe about him and even what we believe about ourselves. It's our choice what we believe. He waits to see what our report is going to be. Why? It tells him how much of Egypt is still in here. How much that's in you that's drawing you into a small ball or circle, being restricted and limited by past scar tissue. And when you see this, and I see it a lot, it is so sad to watch. 
People that have been free for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, but they still have Egypt inside of them. In fact, it was one of the biggest shocks when I started ministry. One of the biggest shocks when I started pastoring is I inherited the congregation my dad pastored. So these were people I looked up to. I thought these people were spiritual giants. Only to find when the roles reversed and I became their pastor, I realized these people are full of Egypt. And man, that disoriented me because I didn't know what to think about that. I'm like, Egypt is all in these folks. To see people who've been saved in church sit even on the front pew for years, they've never grown one inch. They've never moved at all. And if you talk to them and you hear their vocabulary before they walk in church, Egypt is still in here. Y'all with me today? It's sad to watch. They were making their choices as free people, but they didn't know they were free. They could have been slaves and landowners all in the same lifetime, but they couldn't receive because of past woundings and trauma and hurt and pain from Egypt. So they couldn't move forward. They were stuck. As free as they were in the physical sense of the word, they didn't feel free. Freedom is not the external ties that bind us. It's also about the internal scar tissue that continues to echo our past and our traumas. That's like that angel and demon on our shoulders that's shouting in one ear. God is shouting in the other ear. And there's constantly this tug of war. But there's this past and there's this pain that keeps us shrinking back. And we pull back and we never stretch that scar tissue because it hurts. Egypt hurts. Egypt is painful. And we never move forward. Anybody that's ever been through a divorce, and I have, just because the physical papers are signed does not mean the soul ties are not there. And there's soul ties that linger from the past. And if you're not careful, they will restrict you from moving forward. Amen? And what happens so much is, is people get stuck right there. They get a divorce or they go through some type of pain, a grief, a loss of a loved one, and they stop right there. Why? It hurts too bad. It hurts too bad to move forward. And they're stuck. They're slaves. And they're going in circles. And, and that happens over and over again. And, and here's how you know it's happening. Because it's going to manifest through their behavior. Everybody awake? It's going to manifest through your behavior. It's coming out of you somewhere. I don't know where, but it's coming somewhere. Your behavior will tell on you. Okay. Here's what else will tell on you. Your mouth. Your mouth will tell on you. If you're really free, your mouth will show that. If you're still talking about it and you rehearse it over and over and over again, you're not free yet. How do I know I'm free? Here's how you know you're free. When you see free and you live free, you're free. When you see things free and you live free, then you're finally free. And so many people are not free. They're looking through a lens and a filter of pain and trauma and scar tissue that has had them bound for years and they've never moved forward. It's amazing how free people respond to God and how slave people respond to God. It's interesting to watch. To watch slave people respond to God and then watch free people respond to God. It, it's, it's, it's intriguing to watch. Step one, God took them out of Egypt. Salvation, it happened in one moment. How many of you know salvation happens in one moment? Just like that. It's instant. You're saved. Just like that. You can be set free and delivered from addiction. You can be set free from abuse. You can be set free from depression. Just like that. You're free. But you don't know you're free. (laughs) 
you're still bound. You're still in Egypt. Egypt's still in you. I think there's a verse in Romans that says, you're no longer, you're, you're, well, it says it's like this. You're in this world, but you're not of this world. Everybody awake? Some of y'all are going. You're in this world, but you're not of this world. Can I hear an amen? So salvation happens instantaneously. You're free instantly. But there's a second step, and it's when Egypt is finally removed from you, and you see free, and you live free, and you act free. Come on. Have you ever heard this? You can take someone from the country, but you can't take the country out of them. You ever heard that? You know what that's talking about? It's talking about the environment that you've been in. Whatever environment you're in, see, here's what, here's what happens with environments. Environments shape us. And so what's very normal to you could be abnormal to someone else. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, my family, this is one example of a hundred. Uh, my parents were not loud people. We didn't holler, we didn't yell, we didn't do all those things. We didn't watch television a lot. There was not a TV playing 24 hours a day in our home. Our home was kind of quiet. I had a best friend. I went to sleep over at his house. His house was like Charlie Loud. Everybody was loud. Wow! The TV, every TV in the house was on. Like that Toby Keith song, every light in the house was on. I mean, every TV, every light, everything was on, everything was playing. His parents were hollering and screaming at each other. I mean, I was in shell shock. And my friend was over here with a toothpick picking his teeth. Why? That was familiar with him. That was the environment he was raised in. It was very normal to him, very abnormal to me. Do y'all see this? So the environment you are in will actually shape you. Everybody say, shape me. We are shaped internally by what happens externally. Slavery became something no longer real, but it was a mentality. There are people in this room, and you've been delivered from the world, but there's still the fear of the world. You still respond like the world. You act like the world. You talk like the world. You smoke like the world. You drink like the world. You you do the things the world is still doing because the world is still in you. God wants Egypt out of us. That's why I said the other day, justification and sanctification are two different things. Justification is salvation. Sanctification is where Egypt comes out of you. To be like Christ, it's choosing a different narrative. And the enemy wants you to prove who you are. That's what he did with Jesus, the three temptations of Jesus. All three temptations. Jesus uh, was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, and all three temptations had to do with his identity. Prove who you are. Prove it. If that's who you are, then prove that you are the Son of God. And Jesus echoed and responded only what his Father said. The devil was like, no, 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 you prove that you are the Son of God. And I want to say something today. I want you to be warned, because I don't want you to be shocked by this. But in El Dorado, Arkansas, in Union County, there is a predominant religious spirit over this place. I'm telling you, I've been born and raised here, I've lived here all my life. There is a religious spirit in this county that hovers over this city. And every time a church or someone else starts doing something for God, they're going to put out your fire as fast as they possibly can. Okay, And we fight it here all the time. All the time we're fighting a religious spirit. Pastor, what is a religious spirit? Here's a religious spirit. A religious spirit always comes with accusations. And a religious spirit will always tell you, you're not enough, you're not doing enough, and you need to do more, and you need to prove it. And this church right here has messed them up. They don't know what to do about us. They don't understand us. How do you know that? Because they ask me all the time. What in the world is going on there? See, this is not supposed to happen on the south side of town. This is supposed to happen on the west side of town or the north side of town. Not the south side or the east side of town. 
What are y'all doing? And furthermore, are you even qualified? It messes them up. Because religious spirits want you to prove who you are. Man, I'm preaching. Prove who you are. Who are you? Who are you to be over there with all those people in your church? How many people are coming? That's not supposed to happen. Oh, where did you go? You must have went and got a big degree somewhere. You must be a doctor. No. I got the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Religious spirits want you to prove who you are. Prove it. Jesus was like this. I love Jesus' response because here's his response. Devil, you don't dictate my authority. You didn't give it to me. And you can't take it from me unless, unless I come in agreement with what you're saying. Because when you come in agreement with what he's saying, then he has authority over you. So if he tells you you're a loser and you repeat I'm a loser, then you just come in agreement with him. Does that make sense? Okay. Devil, I didn't get it from you and you can't take it from me. Fear is playing the game on his battlefield. Fear is playing the game on his battlefield. And the devil is all about carnality and flesh. If we take the bait of fear, then we have to react and defend ourselves all the time. All the time. So who is really the Lord of our life? If you have to react about everything posted online or everything said about you, you're constantly reacting. What is that? That's fear. That's fear. A spirit of fear consumes you like a snake, squeezing the life out of you. And every time you exhale, it takes more and more and more of your authority. That's what happens. When you're afraid of something, you want to know everything about that something so you won't be afraid. But the problem is, and listen to me, the more you focus on it, the more fear you have. It's the truth. I'll give you an example. If I focused on what I'm doing right now, if, I went, if every day of the week I was so worried about getting up here preaching to several hundred people and God only knows through that camera how many people I'm preaching to every week, if I focused on that all the time, I'd be in a straitjacket going, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. Why? Because if you dwell on something long enough, and you let it consume you over and over and over, it becomes larger and larger and larger. That's why I'm not a big fan of worrying about sickness. I I think we exaggerate it way too much. Oh my God, I think I got a fever. Oh God. Job said the thing I feared the most came on me. Why? Because you're focused on it. It consumes you. And then it ends up happening to you. Does that make sense? Man, I could preach a lot, but I don't have time. Fear is real. You need to know this. Fear is real and it's demonic and it starts when you're young. You don't go looking for fear. Fear comes looking for you. It happens in babies. They don't want to be left alone in the dark. For me, I saw monsters in the closet. Under the bed, whatever. Fear, you don't go looking for fear, fear comes looking for you. Here's what I want to say. Egypt is born in us. Symptoms of fear, and I'm done. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) You won't like this part. Here is ever how many listed here of symptoms of fear. Y'all know what symptoms are, right? Like the commercials, when they give a medicine commercial, and at the end they give you all the symptoms that could happen, like you could die if you take this medicine. Yeah. Okay, here's the symptoms of fear. Are y'all ready? And this is just, there's so many more, but here's a few. If you're tempted to return to an unhealthy environment just because it's predictable or familiar, you're dealing with a spirit of fear. You're dealing with a spirit of fear if you're overly concerned with getting permission and earning other people's approval. You're dealing with a spirit of fear. 
You're dealing with a spirit of fear. If you're always looking over your shoulders, afraid your past will catch up with you. You're living in a spirit of fear. You may be dealing with a spirit of fear if you expect the worst case scenario every single time. You may be dealing with fear if you translate every small inconvenience as God is against you. Here's another one. You may be dealing with fear if you can only focus on the potential risk and not the potential rewards. You may be dealing with fear if your success is defined by how pleasing and acceptable you are to other people. That's fear. Other people have to like what I'm doing. Here's another one. If there's always bigger reasons why you can't do something than why you can do something, you're dealing with a spirit of fear. Here's another one. You may be dealing with fear if you struggle to trust those in authority. I don't trust them. Why? Past woundings, trauma, hurt. I don't trust the leader, so I'm going to control everything, because if I can control everything, then I I can somehow trust them. I'm going to tell you, you're going to go on that merry-go-round around and around and around until God sees you open your hands and go, I trust you, God, with the leadership you put in my life. Amen. Amen? Here's another one. You may be dealing with fear if you still idolize elements of what enslaved you. I'm going to say that one again. If you still idolize the elements of what enslaved you to begin with. Watch this. The children of Israel almost turned around for food. They almost went back to slavery. Did y'all hear what I said? Slavery. They almost went back to chains and being enslaved and working from sun up to sundown for one thing, food. That should tell us how powerful comfort is to us. We will sell our soul to the devil as long as we're still comforted. Let me tell you something. This is a side note. Freedom is inconvenient. Freedom is inconvenient. You're going to be inconvenienced if you really want freedom in your life. Meaning you're probably going to have to let go of some things that are comfort to you. And you're going to have to get uncomfortable. Amen? Here's another one. You may be dealing with fear if you'd rather wander around in the present than fight for the future. Here's another one. You may be dealing with fear if you do not want to be celebrated for your success if it means you will be accountable for your mistakes. I worked with a guy for years, so gifted, gifted beyond anybody on that job site, gifted. And he was a helper his whole career. And his famous saying was this, I don't want to be responsible. Could have had tremendous success, could have owned his own business, would have been successful at it, unbelievably talented and gifted, but he was afraid of mistakes. Here's another one. You may be dealing with a spirit of fear if you don't expect much, then you don't want much expected of you. Or you won't have much expected of you if you don't expect much. Here's another one. You may be dealing with fear if you won't let yourself dream and want more. If you judge from your future based on the pattern of your past, not expecting it to ever get better, you're probably dealing with a spirit of fear. Two more, if you allow other voices to drown out the voice of God, then you're dealing with a spirit of fear. If you reject yourself before someone else can reject you, you're dealing with a spirit of fear. All of these is acting on perception and inferiority. What does the Bible tell us in Timothy about fear? God has not given us a spirit of what? But of what? But of power, love, and a what? sound mind. So that scripture tells us a lot. Here's what it tells us. If you have a spirit of fear, you're powerless. Fear is the opposite of power, love, and a sound mind. Okay? It's why why people scratch their heads and go, why did they do that? And we're all dumbfounded by it. Why? They, They had fear. They reacted out of fear. 
When you complain, you're continually bringing up your victimhood over and over and over again. Well, they don't like me. They didn't invite me. They didn't ask me to do that. And God says you're as much of a victim of your circumstances as a diamond is to the pressure of the earth. And the things we have experienced shape us and mold us. And can I tell you something? And I love you so much, but I'm going to tell you something hard. Are you all ready? Being a victim don't look good on you. It just doesn't look good on you. Being a victim will never look good on you. Can I hear an amen? amen. Pastor D, would you come? Worship team, if you would make your way. Praise you, Lord. Y'all getting anything out of this? The enemy loves for us to sit around and play victim when God has already done the greatest thing He's ever going to do for us, which is send His Son, Jesus. And now He's waiting for us to walk it out. Let me give you one more nugget. Don't put your notebook up yet. Here we go. The root word in the word authority is the word author author and the one who's already wrote your life out has given you authority to walk it out amen father we praise you worship team make your way up here father we praise you right now god you're doing something in this room i feel it it's it it it, it feels like a front like a storm front has moved in this room not in a bad way but in a good way and god today you want to drive out fear out of our lives i deal with it I know everybody in this room deals with it. Unless they got a religious spirit, they'll admit it. But religious spirits don't admit I have wrongdoings. But I'm not afraid to admit that I, I'm fearful sometimes. We all deal with this spirit of fear. Why? We live in Egypt. This world is Egypt. And Egypt wants to be in us. And God wants Egypt out of us. And so God today, we just surrender is this song that Pastor Alicia is about to sing. God, we just surrender, and God, we're available to you today in this service. We've got ample time between now and lunch to just do business with you. And God, today you're going to cut away some things out of our life, some fear, some worry, some anxiety, some depression, some abuse, some trauma, some scar tissue is going to be stretched today. And I'm going to move that thing that hurts. I'm going to move it and move it and move it until I'm free and it no longer hurts me anymore. God, we're going to get rid of the spirit of fear and confusion today. We're going to get rid of the spirit of lack. That's fear. That there's not going to be enough for me. That I'm going to miss out. So I'm going to go to the store and buy all the bread and all the milk because I'm scared there won't be enough. And God said, who clothes you? Who is your source? Is Brookshire's your source? Walmart's your source? Or am I your source? What is your source? Is your boss your source? Or am I your source? What is your source? God said, I want to be your source. Galatians 5.1 tells us a lot about freedom. And it tells us freedom, according to Galatians 5, is on us. God's not going to choose freedom for you. You've got to choose it. God's done everything He's going to do. He's given you freedom, but you have to choose it. You've got to want it. God, I don't want Egypt in me. I don't want to talk like Egypt. I don't want to drink like Egypt. I don't want to smoke like Egypt. I don't want to snort like Egypt. I don't want to cuss like Egypt. I don't want to react like Egypt on social media. God, I don't need all that. I don't want to live by perception and what people think of me. I'm not going to live in that bondage and fear and slavery. And God, this morning, this afternoon almost, God, we relinquish this to you. And God, we say we're available. If you'd stand to your feet right now. Come on, stand to your feet. God, I release this to you. Everybody say that. I release it to you right now. Everybody say, I drive out fear right now. I take my God-given authority and I rebuke fear over my life. I rebuke Egypt out of my life. I will walk this thing out and Egypt will walk out of me in the name of Jesus. Egypt will walk out of me. I declare it. I shout it. I believe it. My words are like gunpowder. And God, I take my tongue and my mouth and I declare that I am free in the name of Jesus. I am free in the name of Jesus. I I just feel this. I'm going to stop thinking like Egypt. 
I'm going to quit thinking like the Egyptians think. I am a child of the Most High God. I don't have to see like that. I don't have to think like that. I don't have to feel like that. I am a believer in the name of Jesus.